The person I'm gonna announce is a very big deal uh, to her puppies. <laughs> to my it, chihuahuas. It's always the people who are a big deal that's just like, um, I'm no big deal. And actually mean it. Crazy people. She is a big deal. Uh, she's a TV journalist for, and I don't know how this is possible, uh, for, she's a TV journalist for four decades, but somehow she's still in her 30s. <laughs> Uh, and she had a cable TV show for six years. She's written four books and has two New York Times bestsellers. Um, she has won multiple awards, four from the Humane Society for reporting on animal abuse. She's won awards from PETA, The Last Chance for Animals, and countless others. Uh, she's the president of JaneUnchained.com, a news network for animal rights and the vegan lifestyle. She's an amazing person. She's very humble. She has two chihuahuas. Three. Three, chi oh, three chihuahuas. <laughs> and she doesn't have a favorite. No. Lies. She's the winner of uh, four Genesis Awards from the Humane Society. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for Miss Jane Unchained. Yes, hi, my name is Jane Velez Mitchell. How are you? Let's hear it for Cam. Woo! Let's hear it for the Low Country Boil. What a great band, right? I am so honored to be here. First of all, I want to find out the audience. How many people here are vegan? Okay, so we've got a large vegan audience. How many are vegan curious? We've got two vegan curious, yeah. If we wake up one person to this incredible lifestyle, it's worth my trip from Los Angeles to Hilton Head because that one person is going to save thousands of animals over the course of their life and also help us all stop climate change. So I want to thank you, sir, for having an open mind and an open heart and coming here to listen. I applaud you for that because that's three quarters of the battle, just hearing this information. And to the lady back there, I also applaud you. To the rest of you, I want to talk to you about stepping up your game. You know, we are hitting a tipping point. Things are getting more extreme, and every single person in this movement needs to be more than a vegan. We must become a vegan activist. How many people are ready to step it up and become vegan activists? So many people here raise their hands that they're plant-based. We need you to step it up. Raise your hand. Are you ready to save the world right now? Okay, now, so, you know, I know that there's a lot of politics, there's a lot of emotional gravity to this word vegan. I'm not trying to promote a word. I'm trying to save the planet from cataclysmic climate change. I'm trying to help human beings avoid disease that doesn't have to kill them or make them sick. I'm trying to end human world hunger. And I'm trying to prevent the unnecessary torture of billions of animals who are just like our dogs and cats. I don't care about that word. Throw that word out the window. This isn't about a word that's become sort of a hotbed. You know, some people love it, I love it. But if some people feel that that comes with a lot of baggage, throw out the word. We had the terrible tragedy in North Carolina, 40 people or more. You know, the death toll keeps changing, lost their lives. That's a tragedy. Thousands of people saw all their hard work and their livelihood go to waste. Years of, you know, fixing up their homes and having a nice place to live, trashed in a matter of hours. And we also saw three and a half million, three and a half million animals left in warehouses called CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding organizations, abandoned to drown in the warehouses. There is something morally wrong with that. Do you agree? Do you agree if we have a system where you can't evacuate that many animals, there's no possible way, and we know that these storms are happening over and over again, that it's really irresponsible to just leave those animals there to drown. Imagine those pigs and those chickens in these warehouses, not knowing what's happening, not being able to escape, and the water is rising very slowly. I saw the images that uh, people that I know went to, to the locations and photographed and videotaped entire giant dumpsters of pigs, pig carcasses. 
And you know, when you look at that picture, you say, there is something morally wrong with that. This is not American. Americans are decent people. And when we find out that something is wrong, we say, hey, let's take a look at that. Maybe that's got to change. So this isn't a political issue. This isn't about you versus me. You know, these storms don't care whether you're a Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, black, white, Latino, Asian, gay, or straight. If they're coming to you, they're going to wipe you out. And I believe it's Mother Nature saying, I'm sending a message because we are 7.6 billion human beings. I want somebody to guess how many animals we raise and kill on this planet every year, not including fish. I am just talking about land animals, chickens, turkeys, pigs, cows, and lambs, five animals primarily. Anybody want to take a guess how many we kill? How many? 74 billion. He said 80 billion. 74 billion animals. Those animals eat, on average, 40 times what we humans eat. They produce hundreds of times more waste than we produce. Think about it. Cows, pigs, manure is the most inefficient food source, period because animals eat a hell of a lot more than they produce as meat or dairy products. It's that simple. You don't even have to be, believe in climate change. It's just that these systems that might have been, you know, doable back when there were fewer people on the planet, now that there are twice as many people on this planet as when I was in high school, it's simply not sustainable anymore. And what's also happening is, while we are raising these animals in terrible conditions, concentrated animal feeding organizations, these animals never touch grass. You've been walking on the grass today. These animals never touch grass. They never see the sky except on the road, on the, on the truck to the slaughterhouse, looking through a little peephole. Now, of course, if you look at the commercials, you'll see these paintings and these murals and these pictures of happy cows and happy pigs and happy chickens. It's all a lie. It's a lie. There is no nice way to raise 74 billion animals. And by the way, I'll probably say something a little controversial. I usually save it for later, but it's on my mind. How many uh, women here consider themselves feminists? Okay. How many people, male or female, are against sexual violation? We all are, right? It's, it's, it's wrong. None of these animals are making love in these factory farms. They are all sexually violated. In fact, there's an industry term. It's called rape rack. So right there, it's not natural. It's not natural. I don't care what your belief system is, but there's something wrong with sexually violating 74 billion animals into existence every year to just to kill them and keep them in warehouses. That's a little bit of the animal cruelty. I just touched on it. I haven't talked about any of the standard operating procedures that if you did once to a dog, you'd be jailed. Castration without anesthesia. Does that sound painful? It is. That's done routinely to farm animals. Tail docking. They cut off their tails. Imagine if somebody came up to your dog and cut off his or her tail. You'd be outraged. Standard operating procedure. Uh, Dehorning. They dehorn these animals without anesthesia. This is standard operating procedure. These animals do not have the protections of even dogs or cats. And I want to say one other thing. Um, you know, there are many philosophers who've said that the mark of our civilization is how we treat our most powerless and most voiceless. And farm animals definitely, right up there with laboratory animals, are our most voiceless and most helpless. And you know what they called the animals who drowned? I say who, because they're individuals, they had mothers, they feel pain. You know, pigs dream. Anybody who has a dog, and I've got three dogs, we know they dream, right? Pigs dream too. All those animals who were left to drown in those warehouses, you know what the farmer, and honestly, I have respect for actual farmers. These are not actual farmers, these are warehouse owners. And they're trapped in the system too. I've talked to them, so a lot of them want to get out of it. 
they're pitted against each other, who can produce the animals the fastest. It's an evil system for everybody involved. But you know what they describe these animals as? Live inventory. So we have reduced this particular set of animals so low in our society that we cannot even consider them victims. To even talk about them as victims is somehow verboten. You have crossed an invisible line. What kind of a sick society are we living in that we can let three and a half million sentient beings drown? And for anybody in the media, even to refer to them as victims, makes them somehow not serious? Oh, are we humans so exalted that even referring to these animals as victims somehow demeans us? You know, to that I would say, being well adjusted to a very sick society is nothing to feel proud of. This is a very sick society when it comes to how we treat animals. And the irony is that everybody's walking around telling themselves and anybody who will listen, I'm an animal lover because I've got a little poodle under my arm. That makes me an animal lover. Meanwhile, I'm wearing them. I'm paying for the killing of them. And you have to know that 99 out of 100 people who are eating all these animals, if you put the animal right in front of them and said, go ahead, do it yourself, kill that pig, you know they wouldn't be able to do it. So there's a level of cowardice there as well. We're hiring the lowest of the low people who really don't have a choice quite often of what job that they want. They're at the lowest level of the socioeconomic spectrum. You over there, you do that killing for me while I walk around and tell everybody I'm an animal lover. How's that for hypocrisy? So this goes across the board. I was watching the news shows after Hurricane Florence, and I'm not, I'm not taking sides here in terms of politics. I stay out of politics because the most liberal commentators and the most conservative commentators and the business commentators and everybody in between were all talking about the manure lagoons that were about to overflow and none of them mentioned the animals. Imagine if your life is reduced to such a low position that the only reference point for your life is the manure that you produced and only in terms of how it impacted people who lived in the surrounding communities. We have reduced animals to the point where they are beneath victims. They are things, they are inventory. And I can tell you right now, Mother Nature is not happy and is sending us a message with every single storm. What goes around comes around. I was a crime reporter for many years. I covered crime. When people committed a crime, an act of violence, we all justifiably wanted justice. We wanted that person to pay for what they did. What is the definition of homicide? the unjustifiable killing of another. But in the case of our laws, it's the unjustifiable killing of another human being. When people do that and they have no justification, it wasn't self-defense, they get punished. They get convicted and they go to jail. It doesn't matter whether they actually did the killing themselves. If they picked up the phone and called a hitman and said, hey, I wanna get rid of my ex-wife, my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my boss, my neighbor, and that person goes and kills the victim, the person who made the phone call and asked him to be killed is just as legally responsible. So when you go and buy animal products and eat them, you might as well have killed them. Now, obviously it's legal in today's society, but there are other forms of justice. And unfortunately, while we're killing these animals, these animals are also killing us. Let's talk a little bit about the health issues. Okay, heart disease is America's leading killer. Kills one out of every four of us. I don't know about you, but every couple of weeks, maybe every month, I get a call from somebody heartbroken, understandably, my relative, my, my aunt, my mother, my father, my husband, my this, my that, died of a heart attack. And of course I feel sad and I offer my condolences. But a lot of times <laughs> that heart attack didn't have to happen. It's very simple. 
For the most part, arteries to the heart get clogged. They get clogged with plaque. Plaque comes from cholesterol. Well, here's a little tidbit. There's no cholesterol in plants. You could go all the way up and down this entire festival, you will not find any cholesterol, okay? Because only animals produce cholesterol. We're animals, we produce our own cholesterol, and animals that we eat produce their cholesterol. So, heart disease is generally caused by the overconsumption of meat and dairy products that are clogging the arteries to the heart. And in fact, there's a great documentary called What the Health? where in the film, the filmmaker, Kip Anderson, goes to a hospital to talk to a doctor who does heart surgeries. And the PR woman comes out and says, we can't talk to you about that. I'm sorry, it, this is our business. This is our business. In other words, we're making money off of people getting heart disease. And that's why I say, they're not just farming the animals. They're farming us too. Okay, and the people making money have never set foot in a farm. I can tell you that. The 0.1% that control all of this live in Manhattan. They don't go to farms. They don't get their hands dirty or their feet dirty. So we're being farmed too because turn on the TV. What do you see aside from fast food commercials? What's the other most common commercial you see? <laughs> Pharmaceuticals. Until you get sick, they can't sell you the cholesterol-lowering drugs, which are a multi-billion dollar industry. Until you get sick, they can't t sell you the diabetes. And there's a connection between diabetes and animal products. Until you get sick, they can't sell you the erectile dysfunction. And not to be x-rated, but erectile dysfunction is a precursor of heart disease because the vessels in that area of the body are smaller than the vessels to the heart. There's even arguments to be made now, and there's a research paper coming up. Have you noticed how dementia and Alzheimer's is skyrocketing? Have you noticed how all these people are getting dementia? Well, there's, I, I'm not a doctor and I don't wanna speak out of turn, but there's research coming up to show a link between all these foggy brains and diet, because there's vessels up there too, they're getting clogged. So a lot of people are suffering, not to mention, you know, a lot of meat that people eat is consumed as processed meat, bacon, sausages, um, nuggets, uh, you know, all the deli slices. All of that has officially been determined to be cancer causing. It's not, oh, it might be cancer causing. No, the World Health Organization said, it's officially cancer causing. So, yet you will see recipes for all these cancer causing processed meats on the front page of major newspapers. The New York Times, and I invite the New York Times on Jane Unchained anytime, um, held a climate change conference at Paramount Studios in Hollywood. And since I worked at Paramount Studios for 12 years, I knew where it was, because I, I was a local news anchor and we were based at Paramount Studios. So I said to five of my friends who are vegan, I said, let's go, let's buy some tickets and hear what they have to say. After an hour of yakety yakety yak, and they never mentioned animal agriculture, which according to the United Nations is a leading cause of climate change far beyond all transportation combined. So there were a bunch of people there in the audience and we scattered ourselves about and we we were waving our hands like kids, you know, the goody goodies in school, please pick me. And of course we confronted them. We said, wait a second, you're the New York Times and you are talking about climate change at a climate change conference and you haven't mentioned that animal agriculture is one of the leading causes of climate change. We put them on the spot. They didn't like it and then we went live with this phone right here. And they were serving pork and chicken and we were like, what are they thinking? That's what's causing climate change. Of course, they asked us to turn off our live video. So the point is that the news media isn't talking about it either. You're probably thinking to yourself, well, if this lady is right, why the hell isn't this all over the news media? Why am I not hearing it when we hear about Hurricane Florence and the manure lagoons? Well, you're not hearing about it because look at the advertisers. Meat, dairy, and pharmaceuticals. And every one of these 
major media institutions has a food department. And if you go up and tell the food department, no, you can't just do your profile of um, hot dogs because those are cancer causing, they're gonna be fit to be tied. Culture doesn't change. The news media generally is not an advancer of a culture, they reflect the culture. It's up for us, the people, to stand up and say, we wanna change. And guess who's paying for all this? Do you know that there's something called the USDA um, Animal Agriculture Indemnity Program, something to that effect, and they will restock those warehouses with animals and recompensate those so-called farmers, those warehouse owners, using tax dollars. All of you and I are paying for this system. It's coming out of our pockets. Now, you would think that a logical society, knowing that animal agriculture is a leading cause of climate change, knowing that these concentrated animal feeding organizations are causing horrible pollution to the neighbors who live there, but also into the rivers. I was down in Fort Myers, Florida last year and nobody could go swimming because the Caloosahatchee River was feeding into the Gulf and there was an algae bloom and people went swimming, they'd get rashes. Where do you think all the pollution's coming from? From agriculture, from animal agriculture. And let me tell you something else. I was just going over you know, latest breaking news so that I bring you new information. This week, there was a salmonella outbreak involving raw chicken that got about 100 people sick in something like 30 states. South Carolina was one of them. How many of you know that 75% or more of all antibiotics sold in the United States go into factory farm animals? Was everybody aware of that? Let me say it again. Actually, it's 80%. Three quarters or more of all, all antibiotics in this country go into farm animals. Why? Because they are kept in such horrible conditions that they would get sick and die if they weren't pumped full of antibiotics. Additionally, the antibiotics they found make them grow faster so they can fatten them up faster and kill them faster. One of the reasons why they don't let them run around is, guess what happens when you run around? You lose weight, you get in shape. They want fat and they want fast. And so most of the pigs that are killed that we see when we bear witness in Los Angeles at the Los Angeles Animal Save are only six months old. And why am I here? Why did I fly from Los Angeles to South Carolina to be here today? Because I love the fact that this is blossoming in the South, which honestly, it's in your self-interest because look at the storms, the path of the storms. Maria, Florence, Michael, they are coming up this way, okay? And so it is in your self-interest to say, wait a second, you know, maybe we've been sold a bill of goods here. Maybe there's something to this. Just maybe we're not getting the whole story. Uh, you're not getting the whole story. And let me tell you, it is an abrogation of journalistic responsibility not to give the whole story to the people because people are kowtowing to their advertisers. They also had a massive beef recall in recent days this month because of the salmonella. These are salmonella outbreaks where they're finding multi-drug resistance. Even the National Institutes of Health, which is generally you know, part of the whole shill of you know, the, the USDA, the Interior Department, and the NIH, they're all kind of in the pocket of the meat and dairy industry. But even the NIH has stood up and said, this is an emerging crisis, and that's a direct quote. If we keep feeding all these antibiotics to farm animals and something develops that is multi-drug resistant, we're all gonna get sick. So that's another reason to think about switching to a plant-based diet. Let me talk about one other thing. How many of you like wild animals? Right, aren't they beautiful? We are destroying wild animals at an alarming rate. We've already destroyed 60% of all wildlife vertebrates. 
Now, again, you don't even have to believe in climate change to get this. This is simple math. We're 7.6 billion humans. As I mentioned, our carbon footprint, our cells, is not that big. It's the animals we're eating that have the large carbon footprint. So 7.6 billion on our shoulders, 74 billion every year. Those animals eat 40 times what they produce as meat, and they certainly are eating a hell of a lot more than people. All the forests that are being destroyed to grow more and more crops, not to feed people, but to feed those farm animals, the wild animals who live on those forests that are mowed down to create either grazing land for cattle or to create farmland to grow soy. You know, people go, oh, soy. Do you know that like 70% of all soy is fed to farm animals? <laughs> You're eating compressed soy when you eat meat. All of those forests are being destroyed to grow crops to feed the farm animals. Every time you destroy an acre of forest, which is happening like this, boom, 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 right now as we speak, destroyed across the world, you are chasing all the wild animals that lived on that forest. So we are chasing these animals by destroying their habitat into extinction. The estimates are within a decade, we will have essentially no wildlife vertebrates left on this planet, no wild animals with bones. No hippopotamus, no giraffes, no rhinos, no koala bears, no kangaroos, no donkeys, no wild horses. The Bureau of Land Management, which is totally in the pocket of uh, the cattle industry, is chasing all the wild horses off our land. They rounded up a thousand of them in Northern California just the other day, some of them pregnant mares who were giving birth as they were being chased. This is an abomination. And people who just say, well, I don't know, like the Uber driver, very, very nice man who took me here today. And I was explaining, I was doing a little rehearsal. I was like, why are you coming here? I said, well, you know, I'm talking to the Veg Fest and you know, we're talking about a plant-based lifestyle. He says, well, now you're taking away my steak. And I understand that, look, I understand that when you have something that you enjoy, you don't want to give it up. But we've got to do the math. I'm a recovering alcoholic with 23 years of sobriety. For a lot of my years, I couldn't go a day without drinking. And if anybody told me, give it up, and forced me and said, you, give it up, I'd be like, bleep you. Get out of, get out of my face. I get it. But then I hit bottom. <laughs> then I had a moment of clarity, and I was like, who was that last night? Oh bleep, that was me. So I woke up, I had a psychic shift, and I haven't had a drink for 23 years. And I'm happier. I mean, who knows, I might have been dead or I might have killed somebody, you know? It's a miracle. I didn't even believe in miracles till I got sober because I never thought I could do it. But it happened. You know what happened? Instead of me saying, I won't drink today, I said, something clicked, and I said, I don't have to drink today. See, we feel like when we get in the clutches of these habits, they're in charge. They're running the show. And I suddenly took the power back by saying, you know what, I'm powerless over this. I'm going to just leave it alone. And it's a very similar thing with meat and dairy. We know that these substances are addictive, not just biologically like there is an addictive component in cheese because in order for the baby calf to drink the mother's milk there has to be an incentive and they put nature put an opium like mixture into the cow's milk and so when we drink the milk the breast milk of another species that's not designed for us we get that craving for cheese too i went vegan 22 years ago, right after I got sober, no accident there. Before I got sober, it was like, woo, I love animals, you know, woo, whatever. Talking to some stranger at the bar. Uh, once I got sober, then I did an interview with a fourth generation cattle rancher by the name of Howard Lyman. You know Howard Lyman? And he's a real rancher. I mean, he was a ginormous, he had a huge, huge cattle ranch. And what happened to him is they feed a lot of chemicals. There's just terrible stuff going on. And uh, he got very sick. And when he was going into surgery, he made a pact with God. And he said, God, if you get me out of this alive, 
I swear to you, I will reveal the secrets of this horrible industry that I've, that I've been running my whole life. And he got better, and he survived, and he went on Oprah, and he did that revelation many years ago, and she said, that stopped me cold from eating another burger, and then the Cattlemen's Association sued her, and she had to take her show to Texas. Remember all this? Maybe, maybe you don't. Anyway, he was doing a book tour after all that. And he came to Paramount Studios and did the interview with me. I was a local news anchor in Los Angeles. And afterwards, he and his publicist came up to me and they said, we hear you're a vegetarian. And I said, yeah. And, and they said, well, do you eat dairy? And I kind of hung my head because they had just told me about how the baby calves are ripped away from the mothers and the mothers grieve and the babies grieve because every mother wants to be with her baby and every baby wants to be with her mother or his mother, and they stick the boys in veal crates isolated, and they, you know, it's just, a, just ripping up families. And I hung my head and I said, yeah. And he and his publicist pointed their finger right on my nose and they said, liquid meat, like that. And that's the moment I went vegan. It took a cattle rancher to get me to go vegan 22 years ago. He confronted me. So sometimes, you know, when they say, don't confront, just, be oh so very polite. If he had been oh so very polite to me, I don't know whether I would have heard it. He confronted me, and I'm glad, I'm so glad he did. Anyway, about a month later, I was having lunch, and somebody put cheese in my food, and I tasted it, and I used to be a cheese lover, and I almost gagged, because it, that's why, you know, rehab is 28 days. It takes 28 days at least to change your behavior pattern and your taste buds and to cleanse yourself of whatever it is that you're craving. So I tasted that cheese after 28 days and I spat it out and I was like, whoa, I can't believe I like that stuff. So if you're struggling with it, just realize that that's part for the course and don't feel bad about it. It's not like the second I got sober, I suddenly didn't know that alcohol existed. In fact, I was already on my way to a vacation at a resort where everybody was doing like tequila shooters and I thought if I get through this week, I'll, everything will be easy after that. And I did make it through the week. So it is gonna be a bit of a challenge, but that's what growth is all about. And, and today, it's, you're much luckier than when I went vegan. I mean, look at the, look at the there's, there's vegan cheeses, Beyond Meat, by the way. How many of you have tasted Beyond Meat? They sold 25 million uh, hamburgers last year, they're going public. They just announced an initial public offering. And guess what? Um, a lot of the big meat industry, the big companies, the big meat companies are investing in Beyond Meat because they see the handwriting on the wall. Look, everybody, Bill Gates, all these people, they realize this is not sustainable. We're not living in some medieval society where there's a couple of you know, million people roaming the earth. We've got 7.6 billion people. We can't all eat this way. We are giving planet Earth a buzz cut. We are giving the planet a buzz cut. And so what we really need to do is to get active. Everybody, everybody needs to get active and kick it up a notch. You know, I'm going live here and you saw me working around and being a pain in the ass trying to get my live set up. Hopefully it's working and the phone hasn't overheated. But, you know, I did that because while I want to speak to all of you, there's too many people on the planet to speak to everybody individually. We all have to use the power of our phones. We have to spread the word for a couple of reasons. One, as I've mentioned, mainstream media is not telling this story. Shame on them. But they're not. I mean, there was just a report saying basically, we're facing a cataclysm environmentally in 12 years. Now, I'll, I'll give props out. CNN did mention something about meat reduction, 30% was recommended. Now, to me, that's like saying, hey, no offense, I think I'm applauding them for doing the report. But to me, that's like saying, hey, your house is on fire. Reduce that, that flame by 30%. No, <laughs> put out the flame, you know? Um, Huffington Post did a report and The Guardian did a report about how, in fact, they said the thing that nobody's talking about is animal agriculture and, and meat consumption. And, and there's a reason for it. You got to watch this film, Cowspiracy. It's online. It's by the same people who made What the Health. Now, all these, a lot of these big environmental groups, 
they're not going to come out and say don't eat animals because they don't want to offend their donor base. They're self-perpetuating bureaucracies. Not only that, but they're often getting money from the meat and dairy industry and the other industries that benefit from meat and dairy like the pharmaceutical industry. So for all of you who have been marching for a cure for 30 years and you're like, what the bleep is up with this march for a cure? When's it gonna come along? Guess what? <laughs> the cure is not getting the disease in the first place. You cannot take credit or charge money for a disease that you never got. And here's another factor for everybody. I don't know about you, but now that I'm technically retired, I, I run a nonprofit, Jane Unchained News Network, but after 40 years of working in the industry, I get my own health insurance. It's going up. It's going up and up and up and up and up a lot. And, you know, hey, I'm like, what the heck? Go to the doctor twice a year, and, you know, I'm going to be paying some like $850 a month. Well, guess what? It's because of bad diets that people are getting sick that the healthcare costs are so high in the first place. Those stent operations are very expensive. People who are eating a plant-based diet are highly unlikely to need a stent operation to unclog their arteries. You know, all the drugs that, that people are taking. I mean, you'd think that everybody has some kind of major ailment when you turn on the TV. I, can't, I don't know about you, but I try to sit down, you know, at, at the end of the day, watch the news, and I can't even have dinner because of these disgusting commercials with everybody suffering from indigestion, and that's putting it mildly. And then, of course, you know, the side effects for all those drugs are, you know, whatever. Could be suicidal ideation, you know, <laughs> far worse than whatever they're trying to cure. It's a scam. Think about it. You're not supposed to go to your doctor and say, give me this pill. That's called going to a drug dealer. That's what you do when you go to the drug dealer. Doctors are supposed to look at you and say, you have a problem, here's what I'd recommend. We've put the system on its head. Follow the money. The meat and dairy industry, the fast food industry, it's only been around fast food since 1955, okay? And so before that, our grandparents and our great-grandparents didn't eat this way. They ate a lot of vegetables. And if they were Catholic, they had fish on Friday. I mean, they weren't eating meat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. This is a relatively new phenomenon. But those manipulators called advertisers have subliminally equated the consumption of meat and dairy with everything from patriotism, family values, upward mobility, keeping up with the Joneses, sex appeal. For men, meat has been masculinity. For women, dairy, femininity. You can see it right in the TV commercials. And it's harder for men to give up meat. Okay, because meat has been equated to masculinity. Oh, meat, right? Dairy, yoga. It's all bullshit. Okay, I'm sorry to... to it's bullshit. You're being suckered. And you know, the people who run these companies, the very, very, very wealthy people, they're not eating like that. They have their private chefs and their kids get all the healthy food they want. <laughs> they're not stupid. But it's time for all Americans who can think for themselves to stand up and say, you know what? You're ruining the environment. You're causing tremendous pollution, climate change. You're causing habitat destruction, wildlife extinction. Not to mention we haven't even gotten a human world hunger. You know, people say to me sometimes, oh, it's, I love your passion, Jane. It's so sweet that you care about animals, but I care about people. I care about children. I'm like, hold on, I care about people too. Right now as we speak, how many kids in a third world country have died of malnutrition? Because you, in your sense of entitlement, have eaten the least efficient food source. It takes 12 to 25 pounds of grain to create one pound of beef. If we fed that grain directly to starving children, we could end human world hunger. It's simple math. You don't even need algebra for that. It's just simple math. These animals, 74 billion of them, are eating up all of our resources. So for the environment, for human health, to save 
species from extinction, to not turn our world into a giant parking lot. I don't, you know, do, do yourself a favor. The next time you're in a plane, look out the window. And what you're going to see is farmland, 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 farmland. And you probably say to yourself, oh, is that beautiful? Look at that green. But it's actually forests that have been destroyed. What we need to start doing is rewilding all of the farmland, or a good percentage of it. And to do that, we need to give farmers another way to make money. We're not trying to put farmers out of business. We understand that these people are working hard. But there are other ways that we can transition. Give you one last example before I shut up. If you look at a chicken warehouse and you look at a mushroom warehouse, they are almost identical. They are both keeping inventory tightly packed in dark conditions. We can switch these chicken farmers who've been devastated over and over again and the, the animal lives wiped out, we could switch them to mushroom farming, which is also a protein-based food. And we could save the planet, save the animals, and the farmers would have a great income as well. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Woo! <laughs> And I'd be happy to take your questions. Uh, this lady asked to elaborate between the connection between the dairy industry and the veal industry. So people said, oh, I would never eat veal. But if they eat dairy, they might as well be eating veal because the dairy industry doesn't really have a use for male calves. So they take the male calves away from the mother so the mother, so that, so that the little baby boy doesn't drink mama's milk, which is what nature intended, so we could steal it and get sick. Um, and they stick these little boys in crates and often they have a chain around their neck and they're isolated. I've seen these veal crates. It's torture. It is torture. You know, to isolate a child, an infant, without his or her mom and the mother grieves and screams. There's video of the mothers charging, fighting as the baby is taken away. It's, uh, it's heartbreaking. And so if, you, if you've got to the point where you say, yeah, veal, hmm, that's terrible. But if you're drinking milk or eating yogurt or eating ice cream, and honestly, I have a terrible sweet tooth. The first thing I did when I got here is I went to that uh, place and I got a chocolate uh, ice cream <laughs> right there, the gelato. It was so delicious. I can't imagine any dairy ice cream that's better tasting than the, gel the chocolate gelato I had over there in the blue tent. There is no need for us to eat dairy that, by the way, is not designed for humans and it's the largest undiagnosed um, allergy that, that exists in the world. You know, the Asian world, and they've done this, the China study, they, they traditionally, until we got a hold of them and started exporting our bad habits to Asia, didn't eat that much dairy. And they have, uh, obviously, lower cancer, greater longevity, lower obesity, and they don't have things like acne as much or dandruff. Once they started eating the all-American sad diet, they started getting all of those problems. We are not osteoporosis. They do a whole scam. Oh, even some of my relatives believe it. Oh, I need to have milk for my bones. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. It creates acidity that, that increases. In Asia, they hardly drank any milk during the study. I mean, they really don't drink milk. They've just recently adopted some of our habits. They have lower osteoporosis rates by far. We drink more dairy than any culture in the history of humankind. And every other commercial on TV is for osteoporosis. What does that tell you? Drinking milk is not going to help your osteoporosis. It's going to make it worse. Thank you for that question. Oh, there's a question. Go ahead. Yes. She's saying, look. You, we're vegan, most of us are vegan here. Well, what are we gonna do? Okay, this phone right here is your best weapon. I wouldn't like to say weapon, let me say tool. Because we're trying to create a culture of normalized nonviolence. Okay, so I covered crime for years and now I'm out of that business because I realized that, hey, that's part of the culture of normalizing violence. I, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. But I only had that realization recently. But in any case, this is your best tool. Here, how many people have, have, have posted to Instagram or Twitter or Facebook while you're here? Okay, okay, great, that's good. Huh? Three groups, Three groups. fantastic. Come on up, come on up. Come on up. We gotta give this lady a hand. 
I might have to make her a Jane Unchained contributor. Thank What's you. your name? Leslie Huss. Leslie Huss. So which groups did you post in what social media? Facebook. Okay. To my following, uh, the Eat Smart Live Longer of Sun City Hilton Head. Okay. And the Palmetto Plant Eaters. And the Palmetto Plant Eaters. Let's hear it for her. She's doing exactly what we should do. Look, let's say if you go, please go to Jane Unchained, my Facebook page, facebook.com slash Jane Velez Mitchell. I've done two videos already. I did a whole look at the whole festival. Share this speech because you will reach somebody who doesn't have this information and might listen to it and go, yeah, maybe she's got a point. You know, let me just say this. Veganism is being normalized. Just like we've normalized eating hamburgers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, CNBC, which is not by any means a radical animal rights <laughs> news organization, it's a business, you know, page. It just, it just said, and I just read this this morning, that nearly 40% of Americans are looking to eat more plant-based meals. And the meat alternative market, the sector of meat alternatives has jumped 22% in 2017. People are waking up. They really are. So what we need to do is help them make that transition. Take any time you have a vegan meal, take a picture of it, a nice picture of it, and post it on your Instagram. The other thing that's important is to give yourself a handle so that you're, you can be remembered by people. What I try to do is tell people to come up with a name that's memorable. Okay, Gnarly Gav did the art for the posters. Yeah. Vegan Linked. This gentleman here who's going, uh, who's videotaping has created a vegan LinkedIn so that all of us can communicate with each other. Technological genius back there from Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah. yeah. You're making a great point. I shop at the big box stores. I shop at Costco. And every time I leave Costco, I write a note. I write a note, dear Costco, please carry just mayo. Dear Costco, please carry. And let me tell you something, let's give, I want to applaud companies when they make the right decision. Costco recently took the Polish sausage off the menu and put in the Alpa store salad, which is 100% vegan and a vegan acai bowl. Yeah, look at Walmart too. Yeah, Walmart has done certain things. Ikea has vegan ice cream and vegan hot dog. Del Taco is now taste testing test marketing a vegan taco with Beyond Meat in, in Santa Monica. We, our, our organization went and taste tested it. Um, Fat Burger has the Impossible Burger. I think it's the Impossible Burger or the Beyond Meat Burger. Um, the Counter has the Impossible Burger. Yeah, TGIF Fridays. The change is happening. Every dollar you spend is a, a statement about this. These people are listening. You're right, they just want to make money. It's, it, this is a consumer issue. Not one more animal would have to die if everybody just said, there's something wrong with this, I don't want to participate anymore. It would collapse and all of those people would get jobs doing something else. Right, here's another thought. Making food that's good for us. Well, there's a lot of campaigns and you know, I want to give a shout out. People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals is such an effective group that they created false front groups just to attack them. I've worked with PETA for pretty much 40 years. Another reason I became an animal activist, because they were the ones who uncovered the Generelli head injury experiments at the University of Pennsylvania when I was a reporter in Philly. And I saw the video and I said, this is wrong. And I, I became an activist then, at that moment. But they do so much to get these companies to switch. And they use high-tech equipment. I just want to tell everybody, don't listen to all the, the fake news about PETA, they, they literally say things, they've created entire organizations, nonprofits, quote unquote, that are funded by industry to attack PETA. They'll say something like, Ingrid Newkirk drives a Mercedes. You know what? She drives a smart car, which is the cheapest car you can get, just happens to be manufactured by a Mercedes. So they twist facts all the time. They say PETA kills. The truth is, I've studied it, I've gone there, all the animals that they have humanely euthanized are animals that needed to go, just like our if our dog or cat is extremely ill, cannot be helped, and a lot of times they do this for poor people who cannot afford the vet bills, they've twisted that all around. So support these organizations. But what I wanted to say, the main thing is to use your phone. You know, go live here, talk to each other, do cooking shows. We do a daily cooking show on Jane Unchained called Lunch Break Live. Has anybody seen it? Yeah, okay, great. 
guess what? You can do your own cooking show. You literally can get this little stabilizer costs like 10 bucks right here on Amazon and this pole, or you can get one of these stabilizers and maybe if, for example, your cookie, you could have your husband, boyfriend, daughter, mother hold the thing and you cook, right? And anybody can do this. And if you just, we need to normalize plant-based food. It's been, it's been given this horrible political image where people think somehow that to eat a vegetable, which people have been doing since the dawn of time. I mean, think how crazy it is. We're suddenly advocating eating fruits and vegetables is a radical idea. It's insane. That's what they've done. They, they've, they've made it sort of freaky to eat healthy. But people are changing. The young people are, you know why they're changing? The young, the really young generations don't watch television. So they're not constantly getting brainwashed. And I'll say one other thing. I was just in Europe. Berlin is an extremely vegan city. And why is it so vegan? I talked to all these experts. It's just incredibly vegan. Because when the wall came down, this entire sector of East Berlin had to reinvent itself. But they hadn't gotten any of the messaging, the commercials, and the conditioning from the West. So they just started doing what they thought was logical. And so veganism cropped up there very easily. That's what's happening with the younger generations. They're not getting all this brainwashing because they're on Instagram more than they're watching some TV show. So they're not getting all those commercials. They still get some, but they're not as brainwashed as the older generation. So it's really, I think, the younger generation that is, is spearheading this because they're seeing, they're seeing the videos. The videos that I can't get my friends who are in their 50s and their 60s to watch. They will not watch it. I say, wait, you're, you're willing to eat that steak, but you will not watch this video. No, will not. Nothing can, I could have to kidnap them to get them to watch a video. So it's the younger people who are more willing, I think, to embrace it. But look, I'm 63, so I'm not putting down people who are in their 60s. I think all of us have the capacity to change at any point in their life, and I'm constantly evolving. I'm constantly saying, wow, who was that? Oh, that was me last week. Maybe I need to change it up and change my message, change my approach. So I'm always learning, I'm always open to change. The second you start being open to change, you're on the way to hasta la vista, baby. This is a great way to feel young and to feel vibrant. You'll feel like a teenager again and you won't need that little blue pill if you know what I mean. I'll answer this last question. Thank you. Hey, let's hear it for Cam. What a great job he's been doing today. Um, last question, yes. Where do you get your protein? We eat more protein than any culture in the history of humankind. Are we healthier for it? Are we fitter for it? And have you ever come back from the doctor where the doctor said, you've, you've been diagnosed with a protein deficiency. It's all bullshit. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.